Um, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. This is the second webinar and part of a multi-part series hosted by Bon Shenkin King in collaboration with the New York State Office of the Medicaid Inspector General's Office. And this program today will focus on the OMIG's um, updated Medicaid compliance program requirements, as well as provide insights into the early implementation of those new standards. Today's um, topics that will be discussed include the changes that spurred the new rules, OMIG's introduction and, uh, or excuse me, OMIG's approach to enforcement and differences resulting from the new rules, the OMIG's perspective on global issues it is observed among providers through early implementation and enforcement, and best practices for providers as they build and enhance a uh, compliance program to reflect the revised standards. And we are very honored and um, it is very special that we have Kathleen Watras join us from the OMIG. Kathleen Watras joined the OMIG's Bureau of Compliance in 2012 and has been the director of the Compliance Bureau since 2019. She was instrumental in the development of amendments to the compliance program regulations, uh, the compliance program guidance, the compliance program requirements, frequently asked questions, and other related guidance. Before her work in the OMIG's Compliance Bureau, she was the director of the OMIG's Bureau of Collections Management. And today's programming will also feature Bond Healthcare attorneys Roger Bearden, as well as attorney uh, Gabriel Overfield. It will also include a Q&A portion at the end of Ms. Watras's presentation. If you have any questions that come up um, during the course of the presentation, please feel free to type them in the chat. Um, those questions that are entered live uh, won't be addressed today, but we will collect them, um, submit them to the OMIG for review, and then circulate answers. And with that, I will turn it over to Ms. Watras. Thank you, Jackson. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for taking time to be here today. I want to start out by thanking the folks at Bond, Shenick, and King for providing a platform for this presentation. So again, I'll go over the, the agenda. Um, today we'll cover changes in Part 521, the Compliance Program Guidance, Compliance Program Requirements, OMIC's Compliance Program Review Process, Best Practices, and Compliance Resources. And we're, we're going to, we have a set amount of questions that we're going to go over at the end of the presentation. And then if there's anything that comes up live today, like you said, we're gonna to respond to those later. So following is some information about the Office of Medicaid Inspector General. OMIG's mission is to enhance the integrity of the Medicaid program while providing high quality patient care for all recipients. And let's talk about changes to part 521. Amendments were adopted on December 28, 2022 and include requirements for compliance programs managed care organizations, and the self-disclosure program. Initial compliance program reviews began in July of this year with a look back review period of April 1st, 2023 through June 30th, 2023. And that will be a progressive, um, the more recent notification letters that we sent out, we've bumped the review period to July to September. So you'll see that bump along as we go in compliance program requirements. Some outcomes from amendments to the regulation include recognizing the key role providers play in promoting the integrity of the Medicaid program, building on existing compliance program and reporting requirements, and more closely aligning the state and federal compliance program requirements. The regulation clarifies requirements by establishing definitions and contractual provisions, requiring written policies and procedures, defining responsibilities, adding a management level compliance committee, enhancing communication and transparency components, and establishing compliance training topics. The regulation also includes the requirement to report, return, and explain overpayments, and more specific auditing and monitoring activities, including additional risk areas, responding to compliance issues, and an annual compliance program review. Let's move on to the specific terms and provider duties defined in the regulation. So having an effective compliance program is now a condition of receiving payment under the Medicaid program. Required providers include those subject to public health law, articles 28 or 36, and mental hygiene law, articles 16 or 31. Managed care providers, including managed long-term care plans, and those who claim or receive a million dollars or more during a consecutive 12-month period. It is each provider's responsibility to determine if they're required to have an effective compliance program. Compliance program certifications are now part of the ETIN form that providers annually submit to the Department of Health. 
Since the Deficit Reduction Act requirements are now included in compliance programs, there is no need for a separate DRA certification. Participating providers are required to submit a copy of their annual E10 form to each MMCO with which they contract. And MMCOs are required to maintain a method for submitting those certifications on their website. Compliance programs have seven elements from which the more detailed requirements stem. I will include good practices versus common mistakes that we have seen during the compliance program reviews. Additionally, I will point out requirements that early reviews are revealing a higher percentage of deficiency. Some of our initial observations for providers when, so when completing the module, providers should be sure to insert responses in the fields for each question in the module, submit all requested supporting documentation, or if they don't have something, acknowledge you don't have that in, in the documentation list at the end of the module. Identify the review period. That's really important. Providers are misunderstanding. So the review period is in the past. So we want to see that uh, your policies, procedures, your compliance activities, what happened during that review period in the past. So creating something now um, to fill in a gap if you need to, is it probably gonna help you with that review period? It'll be good going forward, but it just won't help you with that review period. One area that we see providers struggle with is applicability of written policies to all affected individuals. We recommend providers define an umbrella term to use throughout policies and procedures and, uh, uh, sorry, avoid using limiting language, sorry. Lost that word for a second. <laughs> written policies should describe the provider's legal and ethical obligations, fundamental principles and values, and a commitment to conduct business in an ethical manner. Written policies should also outline the ongoing operation of the compliance program, document the implementation of each of the seven elements, and meet Deficit Reduction Act or DRA requirements. And that's something that I want to mention. Uh, early reviews are revealing a higher percentage of deficiency with this section. It's section 521-1.4A2IX. That's the DRA requirements. <clears throat> Compliance program guidance addendum B provides information regarding DRA requirements, including the laws that providers written policies need to include detailed information about. So that hopefully that's a little bit more helpful for providers. Um, we do see some higher deficiency in, the, in those requirements. For managed care organizations and managed long-term care plans, and collectively refer, we've referred to them as MMCOs, the written policies should also describe implementation of the requirements of subpart 521-2. Providers should review compliance related written policies annually. And the best practice is to update them on an ongoing as needed basis. The regulation defines primary responsibilities for the compliance officer that should be included in their job description. OMIG recommends that the compliance officer not be the general counsel or chief financial officer, report to those positions, or be involved in activities that conflict with compliance activities. If it is not feasible for the provider to separate the compliance function, a procedure for addressing conflicts of interest or potential risks is recommended. The compliance officer should develop and maintain an annual compliance work plan, which is a key component in demonstrating that a provider has an effective compliance program. Early reviews are revealing a higher percentage of deficiency with section 521-1.4B1II, and that's having an annual compliance work plan that outlines the provider's proposed strategies for meeting the requirements of, of section 521-1.4. And specifically, the emphasis on subdivisions A, which is written policies, D, which is training and education, G, auditing and monitoring, and H, responding to compliance issues. So that's something we're seeing some issues with. Providers should designate a management level compliance committee that will coordinate with the compliance officer. The committee members must be in management to help reinforce tone from the top. The regulation defines primary responsibilities for the committee that the charter should outline such as duties, responsibilities, membership, designation of a chair, and frequency of meetings. And so early reviews are revealing a higher percentage of deficiency with this area. Um, that's 521-1.4C and C1-III. So outlining the responsibilities of the compliance committee in a compliance committee charter specifically outlining responsibilities to advocate for the allocation of sufficient funding, resources, and staff for the compliance officer to fully perform their responsibilities. So that's a big concern right there. 
And again, we're talking about outlining those responsibilities in the charter. All affected individuals must receive compliance program training and education that includes all required topics. Make sure your compliance training and education is in a form and format accessible to all affected individuals. For example, if you have an affected individual whose primary language is not English, offer your training in their preferred language. Providers should develop and maintain a training plan that outlines the required subjects or topics, the timing and frequency of training, which affected individuals are required to attend, how attendance is tracked, and how the effectiveness of the training is evaluated. So that training plan is a key component in demonstrating the effective training. Early reviews reveal a higher percentage of deficiency with the compliance program training plan outlining all required subjects or topics uh, provided for compliance program training. And we're talking about section 521-1.4 D1 triple I, IV and four. So specifically the role of the compliance officer and the compliance committee, how affected individuals can ask questions and report potential compliance related issues to the compliance officer and senior management, including the obligation of affected individuals to report suspected illegal or improper conduct and the procedures for submitting those reports and the protection from intimidation and retaliation for good faith participation in the compliance program. So again, we're talking about the training plan outlining this information. I'll get into a little bit about um, determining effectiveness of compliance training. The regulation does not specify how the effectiveness of the training is to be periodically evaluated. So I've put together some examples for you. Um, the use of pre and post tests that show growth in knowledge, identifying steps to address those who do not pass the test, Analyzing identified compliance issues and investigations to identify trends. For example, is there evidence the lessons were applied in the workplace? Auditing incidents, logs, and hotline reports to evaluate the effect compliance training has had on behavior. For example, was there an increase of reports of compliance issues for training after training occurred? Using compliance surveys to determine compliance knowledge, attitudes, and perceptions. So do those trained feel the compliance training was useful and sufficient? Conducting a knowledge of survey several months after compliance training was completed to determine if there's any retention of information. All lines of communication must ultimately go to the compliance officer, but there are methods such as hotlines that may not necessarily be directly overseen by the compliance officer. For example, they may be answered by compliance personnel or contractors with a requirement that they send reports directly to the compliance officer. Confidentiality should be maintained unless the matter is subject to a disciplinary proceeding, referred to or under investigation by Mufuku, OMEG, or law enforcement, or disclosure is required during a legal proceeding. If providers have a website, they should make information concerning their compliance program, including their standards of conduct on their website. Early reviews are revealing a high percentage of deficiency with Section 521-1.4E5. If applicable, the required provider shall make available on its website information concerning the compliance program, including the standards of conduct. So we're seeing some difficulties with that. Um, and that's really important to, to make that information available to all affected individuals. Written policies that contain disciplinary standards should be published and disseminated to all affected individuals. Disciplinary standards may be defined in documents other than policies. For example, they can be found in bylaws for governing body members and in contracts for contractors. The same methods of discipline may not apply across all categories of affected individuals. However, they should be fairly and firmly enforced. A best practice is that disciplinary actions should be progressive. Providers should maintain documentation demonstrating that the risk areas required by Part 521 were considered and prioritized, and if needed, audited or monitored. The annual compliance work plan is a good place to document this analysis. Early reviews are revealing a higher percentage of deficiency with Section 521-1.4 G1I, specifically performing audits that focused on risk areas for governance, mandatory reporting and credentialing. So those are some problematic risk areas that are being addressed. 
The annual compliance program review may be carried out by the compliance officer, compliance committee, external auditors, or other staff. And I think we've got some additional information further on about um, um, other staff and in in, in, as far as doing the annual compliance program review. Providers should perform monthly exclusion checks. If applicable, a requirement for contractors to complete monthly exclusion checks should be included in contract provisions. Providers should have systems for responding promptly to compliance issues when raised and investigating and correcting compliance problems. Investigations of compliance issues and related disciplinary actions must be documented. Specific details should be included. And early reviews are revealing a higher percentage of deficiency with section 521-1.4 G1 triple I. And that's the design, implementation, and results of any internal or external audits should be documented. So we're having a little difficulty with that. Doesn't mean the activities aren't happening. It's just that providers need to do a better job about documenting that. Providers should also have a system for ensuring compliance with state and federal laws, rules, regulations, and requirements of the Medicaid program. Providers shall promptly report violations of a state or federal law, rule, or regulation to the appropriate governmental entity. Key components of subpart 521-2 include fraud, waste, and abuse prevention programs that are incorporated into compliance programs, special investigation unit staffing requirements, contractual requirements, fraud, waste, and abuse reporting, and a public awareness program. This part of the regulation recognizes the key role that MMCOs play in program integrity efforts, promotes collaboration and partnership with OMIG, builds on existing MMCO compliance and reporting requirements, and creates consistency across both mainstream and long-term care plans. OMIG's compliance program review process involves notification to the provider for commencement of a review and a review period in the past. The provider downloads the module from OMIG's website and submits a completed module within 30 days. OMIG reviews the completed module and documentation submitted by the provider. Review staff complete an assessment for each requirement based on the provider's answers in the module and the supporting documentation. A conference call is held with the provider to discuss any weaknesses and the provider is given an opportunity to submit additional supporting documentation before a final score is calculated. OMIG then notifies the provider of the results of the review and turnaround time varies greatly from provider to provider based on the provider size, complexity, resources, culture. Um, so one review is not the same as the next. Uh, compliance program reviews for MMCOs also address how the MMCOs are meeting the requirements of subpart 521-2. Okay, we'll talk about possible sanctions and penalties. If a provider does not have a satisfactory compliance program, they may be subject to sanctions or penalties, including revocation of the provider's agreement to participate in the Medicaid program. OMIG may impose penalties for failure to have an effective program up to $5,000 per calendar month for the first instance, or $10,000 per calendar month for subsequent instances. Providers should implement corrective actions in all areas identified by OMIG as needing improvement. Implementation of corrective actions may not be immediately reviewed by OMIG, but failure to implement corrective actions could subject the provider to further sanctions during a future review. So again, if we have a provider that's having a lot of difficulty that we impose a penalty, um, chances are we're gonna come back and see again that you implemented plans of correction. Compliance program best practices. Providers should utilize the module and self-assessment form on OMIG's website to guide the annual compliance program review. The compliance work plan is a key component in demonstrating that a provider has an effective compliance program. Disciplinary actions should be progressive. When you receive a notification letter, you should promptly begin completing the form and gathering related documentation. While most of the documentation should already exist, it may take time to put it all together, so please don't delay. Providers should communicate early and often with OMIC throughout a review. And if I could just take a moment to set the tone there, um, we try to approach providers as if we're, we're trying to help them. Um, they need to have an effective compliance program. It's a requirement. And we're going to do whatever we can to educate them, including these types of presentations, <clears throat> so that they can implement those effective compliance programs. 
So, I mean, really, I just want to set the tone there is that, you know, we're not coming to get you. We're, we're trying to help you meet the requirements and uh, certainly to help the Medicaid program as a whole. So we think of the providers as our partners in that effort. So to sum it all up, compliance, it's the right thing to do. Let's cover some compliance resources. The Compliance Library on OMIG's website contains the Compliance Program Guidance, Compliance Program Requirements FAQs, Compliance Guidance and Resources, Compliance Related Laws and Regulations, and Compliance Program Self-Assessment Form. Related questions can be sent to compliance at omig.ny.gov. OMIG Contacts and Resource Information. OMIG has a main phone number and website. You can report potential fraud, waste, and abuse to OMIG's Medicaid Fraud Allegations email address or call the Medicaid Fraud Hotline. You can join OMIG's listserv on the website and follow OMIG on Twitter. You can reach OMIG via its dedicated email address. And I was asked to, to encourage everyone, um, please join the Office of the Medicaid Inspector General on November 30th when we host an online engagement session. Uh, the purpose is to share feedback received during our 2023 provider engagement forums, responsive actions taken by OMIG, as well as next steps and plans for ongoing provider engagement. There will also be time allotted to respond to audience questions during that session. And information can be found on OMIG's website under news and announcements. So there's a registration that you need to complete and then you can participate. Thank you for attending this presentation. I want to thank the folks at Bon Chunnik and King for inviting me to do this presentation. And thank you, Jackson, Roger, and Gabriel for your input. We hope this information helps you understand compliance requirements. And now we can get to some questions. So, Kathy, thank you so very much. And I want to say thank you in particular. Uh, you incorporated some, some materials about the lessons learned in the reviews. Mm -hmm. Uh, into the presentation. So that actually mooted a couple of the questions that came through, uh, but I think made it uh, a very uh, timely and effective uh, presentation. There are multiple questions in the chat. Uh, yes, these slides will be distributed after this. It's probably going to take a day or so uh, to do that. And yes, the webinar will be posted on the Bond website. So you can... Uh, watch it at whatever speed you desire and 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 incorporate the information into your thinking uh you know we're very grateful to the omic and to kathy in particular for for making themselves available you know we're we're happy to support providers and in, in trying to meet these new requirements and i think it's really helpful to have that um, um the information that um is uh, been provided uh so i'm going to ask a couple of questions and then turn over to my colleague gabe and we're going to go back and forth a little bit in the time that we have remaining um, and as we said, if you have additional questions uh, that you want to put in the Q&A to the degree to which they're similar to questions we've already received, we'll pose them to the degree to which, you know, we need to go back. We're going to do that. And then uh, we'll we'll get back to you individually about, about that information. Um, so, Kathy, you covered uh, pretty extensively some of the uh, uh, observations you've had in the first few months of the uh, the process. One question that came through was uh, from a, a provider asking, in what way is uh, OMIG looking at uh, due diligence of the providers in, in, in seeking compliance in this kind of early phase of the regulations uh, effectiveness? Okay, so, um, well, first off, we take into consideration each provider's unique circumstances, characteristics when conducting the reviews. So, you know, if they're doing a good job of documenting all their efforts, that's helpful. Um, but you also have to consider at this point, providers have had a significant amount of time to bring their compliance programs up to speed, um, especially with the new requirements. And they should have written policies and systems in place that meet the requirements at this point. Um, Implementation of compliance activities required in those policies and procedures may take a little bit longer. For example, it's possible some providers haven't fully implemented routine auditing and monitoring of all risk areas. However, they should be able to demonstrate they have considered and prioritized those risk areas and are able to provide a compliance work plan that would identify a timeline for the auditing and monitoring activities. So, so sort, of, sort of a related question came in, which was, um, how is the evaluation of the sufficiency of a, of a provider's program 
uh, being done? You know, how, how does it determine that, you know, provider's program is, is sufficient or the, the opposite? Okay. So let me start with, um, you know, we have a definition of an effective compliance program that's in the regulation. Um, that's one that at a minimum satisfies the compliance program requirements and is designed to be compatible with the provider's characteristics. Um, for example, the compliance program should be well integrated into the company's operations and supported by the highest levels of the organization, including the chief executive, senior management at the governing body. It should promote adherence to the provider's legal and ethical obligations and be reasonably designed and implemented to prevent, detect, and correct non-compliance with Medicaid program requirements, including fraud, waste, and abuse most likely to occur for the provider's risk areas and their organizational experience. So OMIG's assessment of compliance programs takes into consideration each provider's unique characteristics. You know, so we don't really try to tell providers specifically how to do everything. We leave it uh, broad enough for them to have flexibility and how they implement everything, but there's certainly they have certain things they need to meet. Um, the compliance program review module outlines all the necessary elements and requirements of an effective compliance program. So while there's seven elements, there are many, many more requirements that fit into those seven elements. And we are testing pretty much all of them. The associated scoring system allows OMIC to review provider documentation received in response to the module and evaluate whether the requirements were identified or observable in the documentation shared or upon subsequent interview during that conference call. OMIC calculates an average score percentage. Um, so to do that, it's calculated for each month of the review period. So we have each requirement is scored for each month of the review period. All right, and um, then we consider an average of those three months. Um, for example, if there's 90 requirements that were met and there were 100 accessible requirements, the average score would be 90%. So that might be a month score, 90%. Then you take the three months, you add them up and divide by three, and you're gonna get that overall average score that we're talking about. And that would determine if they're passing or failing um, or satisfactory, not satisfactory. So the 60% is the score for that. Um, if they're 60% or greater, we're gonna say that it's a satisfactory program. There might be uh, chances for improvement and recommendations that we'll make, um, but we're not gonna seek any further action at that point. Um, if it's less than 60%, then we're gonna probably talk to the provider about some other actions. There's a couple of questions that came through that are related to the conversation you just had, and we can defer them. But one, one is just kind of how long this process will, will typically take and how many have been sort of completed at this point. If you if you're not prepared, that's, I understand that, but that may be something that's on, on, on the tip of your on tip of your tongue. So I thought I would ask. Well, earlier in the presentation, I did say, you know, um, the length of time varies, and that's because providers are very different. I mean, we deal with all the provider types from large hospital systems, MMCOs, MLTCs, all the way down to transportation providers, pharmacies, you know, and everything in between. Um, so if you can imagine the size complexity of all of these different compliance programs, some take more time, some take less time. Um, so there is no standard time. Um, we're trying to work through them as quickly as we can, um, uh, certainly quicker than we used to do in the past. I guess that was the answer based upon your earlier slide, but I, I didn't want to guess for you. And then yeah. one question, more question before I turn it over to Gabe for the next set, uh, set of questions is, is, is it the intention uh, of OMIG to, when, when these reviews are complete to make, to make them public? Obviously audits are, are routinely made public. So there's, right. um, there's that question out there in the field. Yeah, and, and I love to address that one because we are not an audit. This is a compliance program review. Many people tend to refer to it as an audit, but it's really not an audit. We're not looking at claims details. We're not looking to identify an overpayment. So no, we don't post the individual assessments on the OMIC website. In the past, we did publish compliance program assessment results, which identified the frequency on a percentage basis, I believe it was of deficiencies that were cited by OMIG during reviews. Um, so we do expect to publish a similar document. We just need to have a meaningful number of reviews completed so that we can we can do that. But that would be aggregate non-provider specific data, correct? Yes, yep. Gotcha, Gabe? Great, thank you. And it's a pleasure to be with all of you this afternoon. And let me reiterate the thanks that my colleagues afforded to the Office of the Medicaid Inspector General for taking this time to educate our audience and to be available for this dialogue. 
And a, a moment ago, uh, Kathy, um, you were talking about having enough data uh, in order to aggregate uh, resources. As a corollary to that, roughly how many organizations are you um, looking at presently, if you can even guesstimate a number? How many have you looked at overall since the changes went into effect, uh, just so that we get a sense of scale on how this process is being rolled out? Okay, well, remember, we didn't send out our first notification letters until July, and providers have a lengthy period of time to respond. So just getting the first round started took a little while. At this point, we've initiated 73 reviews and we're working through those. They're, they're all at different levels of completion at this point. That's very helpful. Yeah. Thank you. And you know, one question that has come up and I'm going to be um, responsive to what's popping up in the chat because I've heard it elsewhere um, is uh, relating to uh, essentially contractors. And what is really now required that is different vis-a-vis -vis contractors? Um, is it going out and training every one of the contractors that has even a marginal touch point to your program? The answer I know, and I feel comfortable speaking on your behalf, uh, unlike Roger perhaps in this moment, is to say, no, that's not what you're expecting as the OMIG. But I know that it is not you know, hands off entirely either vis-a-vis -vis your contractors. There's a difference, there's a change, and the language of the 521 standards is more explicit around the responsibility you hold for contractors. So anything that you could do to provide more color around that now would be really appreciated. Appreciate okay. So let me first identify training and education for contractors. Um, they should be made aware of the provider's specific compliance program requirements and methods for reporting issues to the provider's compliance officer and having an opportunity to ask questions. Uh, so providers may accomplish compliance program training for contractors by annually distributing a copy of the compliance program and the written policies that apply to those contractors. Okay, so they need to be aware of what applies to them so that they can comply with it. And we're using that word compliance way too often, I think. <laughs> um, so we also think that along with that, you can send them a letter or a memo, a distribution letter or memo that identifies the provider's risk areas and the organizational experience to the extent these relate to the contractor's role and responsibilities within the provider's risk areas. Um, so basically all the required topics that are, that are in the regulation for compliance program training, you can summarize that in a letter or memo for the contractor. Certainly if you have a contractor that works in your facility, like in a hospital or a nursing home or you know, in, in the facility so that you have access to them, I would train them the same as I would anybody else. Um, but if you have contractors that have their own facility and they work remotely, this might be a way to do it. It's a best practice to include a data distribution letter or request that contract contractors complete an acknowledgement or demonstrating that compliance training occurred. So I'm, I'm hearing in that answer, which I thank you for on behalf of the audience, um, a calibration essentially relative to the exposure that the uh, vendor may or may not um, extend to uh, the entity um, in terms of how it interacts with said entity. Um, and I also heard you alluding to training in some instances, um, letter communication in other instances. Um, is that also a discretionary call by the provider so long as it can be defended or are there more prescriptions as it were that the OMIC might have around some of that? That's really a recommendation or a guidance. Um, you know, we consider what's in the regulation to be required and, you know, in the guidance and recommendations to be additional information, just like the, the new federal guidance that just came out, it's, it's recommendations. Um, but we think that, you know, if, if you can send this to the contractor, use a distribution letter that you can keep a copy of to prove that you sent it to them and you gave them an opportunity to review the information, you distributed your policies to them and gave, gave them communication methods back to the compliance officer if need be um, and a way to ask questions, that's probably pretty good for contractors. Okay, thank you. Um, let me turn to, <clears throat> excuse me, some of the other questions that came in before the webinar. And to those of you who are typing in questions, we'll do our best to answer them in the time that remains, but some of them may be ones that we address, much as we did during the first of this uh, series with the OMIG, 
Uh, we'll collect them. We'll uh, provide the opportunity for the OMIC to respond to them and make sure that the individuals who've asked those questions get answers. And where they can be anonymized and sent out in more general form to all of you, that's something that certainly we'll do. So please rest assured that even if we don't get to a typed question that one of you might have entered in the chat, it will ultimately get addressed. But returning to some that were asked before this uh, broadcast went live, um, please, Kathy, help us understand with regard to a compliance officer, um, and this is sort of within the vein of the effectiveness of a compliance program, what constitutes sufficient independence for a compliance officer? For instance, is someone who um, works on a consultative basis sufficient? Um, does that person need to be an FTE? My understanding is no, that, that, but there needs to be some level of sufficient and consistent oversight. But I'd really rather that you tell us what you understand the rules of the road to be, please. Okay, so I think you're talking about the annual compliance program review where it calls for independence um, of people performing that review. Yeah, it's referring to that language, but also yeah. recognizing that compliance officers come, as it were, in all shapes and sizes, and yeah. uh, each organization is distinct. Some mm -hmm. organizations may wish to essentially um, contract for um, that service with someone who is not an FTE. Um, others may have a part-time FTE involved. You know, there are lots of ways to go about uh, compliance work, of course. And I'm interested in just knowing, you know, vis-a-vis -vis the new standards, if there are any differences in the way the OMEG approaches those questions, again, in connection to the language that you were just highlighting. Okay, so let me go over that section and then I'll offer some explanation. Thank so, you. Um, for section, it's 521-1.4 G2I, the reviews may be carried out by the compliance officer, the compliance committee, external auditors, or other staff designated by the required provider. Provided, however, that such other staff have the necessary knowledge and expertise to evaluate the effectiveness of the components of the compliance program they are reviewing and are independent from the functions being reviewed. So the way we're interpreting that is that specific requirement refers to other staff. It's not referring to the compliance officer, the compliance committee, or external auditors. Okay, that's helpful. So uh, just to extend this line of uh, conversation a, a bit, um, are there any changes that are um, ironclad or otherwise specific uh, relative to who a compliance officer can be or not be that is reflective of you know, these updated standards? Well, we don't recommend or we recommend that they not be um, the chief compliance or the the general counsel um, or the chief financial officer or anybody that reports to them. So we figured that's a, a bit of a conflict of interest. And so we don't recommend that that occur. Um, aside from that, you really wanna make sure you have someone who's trained and knowledgeable about compliance programs because there's a lot of detail here. There's a lot of things that need to occur and just throwing it at someone without preparing them or having them trained on what the requirements really are is, is difficult. That's a very helpful answer, thank you. And then, um, are there elements of overall um, annual effectiveness assessments that the compliance officer uh, should not be doing um, themselves, but perhaps relying on others in the organization? Um, you know, try, as we think about workflow and we think about, you know, essentially a, a compliance um, structure in an organization, um, to put the question another way, what is fairly held on the shoulders of the compliance officer versus what, you know, in a best practice world, um, you'd want to see others engaging in so that they're supporting that compliance officer. Okay, so your governing body should have oversight of the compliance function. Um, you have a compliance committee with some coordination efforts that go on. But really the compliance officer is your subject matter expert. Um, they're the best person in the organization to do an analysis of the compliance program, but is that a conflict for them because they're the one that actually created the compliance program or, or manages it? You know, so I think you hear a lot of consultants recommend that, you know, you engage outside people to do that assessment, um, but really the compliance officer is your subject matter expert. They're in-house. Um, I see no reason why they can't do it as long as they're, they have the right approach. 
Um, but then your governing body and your compliance committee should have a piece in that as well. There's oversight for the governing body and collaboration with the compliance committee. That's very helpful. And then just last question before I turn it back to Roger. Um, you know, as far as um, staffing is concerned, you know, one of the things that we hear or otherwise that we've read, um, you know, throughout the uh, communications that your office has issued in these last six months or so since the new standards uh, became enforceable is, you know, the importance of staffing, the importance of funding, the importance of demonstration that, as it were, you take compliance seriously. What are representations of that that you have found to be um, effective, meaningful, consistent with your expectations, and what are some that might fall short comparatively? Okay, well, every provider is going to be different. Again, you get into the size, complexity, the, the risk areas, um, category of service, and it, it, they're just all over the place. Um, and we tend to speak generally because of that. Um, but, you know, we should have, if the compliance officer has other duties, the provider should demonstrate that they have done an assessment to determine whether they are hindering their, their compliance program responsibilities. Um, at a minimum, that should be done annually if that's the case or whenever the compliance officer's duties change. Um, providers should demonstrate that they have assessed whether the compliance officer has allocated sufficient staff and resources to satisfactorily perform their responsibilities. Um, you know, I think when you get the oversight with the governing body and the collaboration with the com compliance committee, if the compliance officer isn't able to do a good job and complete all their responsibilities, it should become apparent um, to those entities and something should be said or done. Um, certainly the compliance committee has an obligation to lobby or promote the compliance function within the entity. Um, also, when you do your annual effectiveness review, if you're identifying that there's a lot of things that aren't done, so you might have great policies or procedures and systems defined and all that, but if you're not completing the auditing and monitoring of all the risk areas and completing timely investigations and documenting all that work, maybe there's not enough resources there. Those are very helpful observations. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And I'll turn it back to Roger for a few more questions. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, there's actually a question in the chat that's specifically, I think, anticipated. And I don't know if you see the the, the chat yourself, Kathy, but there's yeah, a there's a question about what happens where there when there's a difference of opinion between the compliance committee uh, and the, uh, the who who recommends more more resources and uh, the resource allocators, be they the 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 executive leadership or the board, who identify that there aren't such resources to to give. I, my guess is that the answer is it's going to be it depends depends upon the the circumstances and the complexity and so on. Yeah. Because you've you've given that answer a couple of times, but uh, uh, I think you were prescient in your uh, in your in your answer. Unless there's something else you would want to elaborate on on that particular question. Well, that in itself is a risk to the entity, um, and and you know certainly it's their business. It's up to them to weigh that risk and and how much risk are they willing to absorb. Um, I, I think that you know if if they fully understand the compliance program and what it's really all about, um, they're going to understand that it's a benefit to them and it could save them a lot of money down the road. It's a good investment. Um, there's a there's also a clarifying question in terms of we had asked. Kind of how long it takes to, and to, to to conduct one of these reviews. Um, there was actually a specific question about the look back period um, uh, for that, and I think that was previously addressed. But it might be worth just reemphasizing if there's some confusion in the audience. Okay, <clears throat> so when we send out our notification letter, for example, we sent the ones out uh, beginning of July. That was our first round. <clears throat> the review period for those reviews goes back from April 1st to June 30th. So it's a look back in time. Um, so if a provider gets a notification letter and they say, oh my gosh, I need, I have some gaps in my compliance program. I need to create some additional policies. That's great going forward, but those policies weren't in effect during the review period that was in the past. Uh, so they won't help you pass the review, but they're good going forward. If I'm a provider, though, just to be clear, and I haven't yet received one of, I'm not one of the lucky 73, uh, I, I, my next look back period would be, say, July 1 to September 30th for the next tranche, or is, you know, if people are thinking proactively, and that would be the the spirit of people participating in this in this webinar, would they be, you know, what's the next period and when do they have to get their homework done by is, I think, probably the was implicit <laughs> in that question. 
Well, I, I guess if you're talking about homework, you're talking about implementation, right? So I'm assuming yep. they have their policies and everything established and they're talking about, you know, doing the activities that are in those policies, right? So training and education and auditing and monitoring and all that good stuff. Um, you know, some of those requirements are annual, like the annual compliance program review. Some of them are quarterly, like quarterly meetings of the compliance committee, quarterly reports to the governing body and the compliance committee, things like that. Um, so when we have a three month review period, something that's annual, all right, um, it may not have occurred or been scheduled to occur during that review period. So we'll take into consideration if the provider just informs us, look, this is our schedule for that annual activity. This is when it last occurred. Here's an example of when it last occurred. And this is when we expect it to occur again. That's great. We can work with that. Um, if it's a quarterly, now that means it should happen during that review period at least once. Okay, so you're gonna to need to give us evidence of that. And then there's routine. Okay, so what does routine mean? Um, I guess that's up to the provider to determine what routine means, uh, but it should be on a regular basis of some sort. But again, communicate to us what that is, what your expectation is for that, and when it last happened, and when you expect it to happen again. Fantastic, and let me throw the mic back to Gabe. I know Gabe, you had a couple of questions, one about the new federal guidance that Kathy already mentioned, as well as uh, some nursing specific uh, coordination between the federal and the state um, rules. Yes, great. Thank you so much. And so, as Roger mentioned, Kathy, you had alluded earlier in your comments to the fact that there's new federal guidance out. And uh, for those of you who are not familiar with it, it's uh, the Office of the Inspector General of uh, the Federal Department of Health and Human Services that has uh, earlier this month uh, issued for the first time in a long time, um, refreshments to uh, compliance best practices. And so we had asked uh, Kathy uh, in advance of today's webinar um, a little bit about that. And um, Kathy, in the comments you've made here publicly, you've indicated um, those remain best practices. They are uh, essentially a, a resource for uh, providers to turn to. But if you could provide just a little bit more uh, detail in terms of how uh, the 521 standards and the like line up vis-a-vis -vis that resource, it would be, I think, quite helpful. Okay, so I haven't studied them yet. Um, I didn't participate in writing them. I just want to put that out front. Um, and so it's a little difficult <clears throat> for me to speak about the intention of the federal guidance because I didn't take part in that. However, obviously, like all of you here, I do have an interest in them and I will study them. Um, it, first of all, I wanna know, is there is there any potential conflict with what New York State is doing? And are there any areas for improvement in the New York State requirements? Um, so yes, we will do a thorough analysis on that. Uh, we haven't done it yet. It's still, I think it just came out last week and I just saw it this week myself. Um, I did notice that it says the requirement should be integrated into every compliance program. Um, it, well, federal, state statutes, rules, regulations, Medicaid program requirements, that should all be integrated into every compliance program. And for this specifically, um, the general guidance, they call it the GCPG, I guess that's our acronym for it, is voluntary guidance that discusses general compliance risks and compliance programs. It's not binding on individuals or entities. So it's really just truly guidance. Uh, I did take a look through the seven elements portion of it. It's a much bigger document and there's a lot more to it, but I focused on that specifically so I could say something. Um, so for element one, that guidance speaks about seven common compliance risk areas. Some do not fall in the state risk areas. So for example, sales and patient initiatives, that's something different than what New York State calls for. Uh, it also uses the term relevant individuals, whereas the state uses the term affected individuals. So it's a similar concept, just a different phrase. Um, in element two, that guidance goes into some details about board compliance oversight. There's similar information the state has talked about in our guidance materials, so it's nothing totally out of line with what we say. In element three, it identifies six specific topics for compliance training and the state requires 10 specific topics. So uh, I think ours is a little bit more extensive than that. Mm -hmm. Now this um, is all um, you know, very helpful. And, and you, know, you 
volunteer that you haven't read it closely yet, but yet, you know, it's very clear you've read some of it and yes. uh, you're, you're integrating um, an understanding of what the differences are. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, we look forward in a future instance to hearing more about that as your office has a chance to be um, more uh, thorough or otherwise uh, more mm -hmm. uh, official, as it were, in terms of, you know, where that standard um, and you know, what the federal government has issued fits in vis-a-vis -vis your work. Um, I ask a question based on some of the clients um, that I serve who are in uh, the nursing home space in specific. Uh, many of them have been um, you know, approaching compliance from both federal and state perspectives for quite a while, um, at some level distinctly from their Article 28 peers. And I'm wondering, um, you know, with this new guidance, um, what is it that is different for them specifically? And how do some of those uh, extant standards relate to, you know, what changed vis-a-vis uh, -vis enforcement in March? Okay, so you're talking about the new OIG guidance then? No, no, no. I'm, I'm, I'm saying specifically with regard to what the OMIG's done, um, you know, with the updates to 521, um, how does that affect nursing homes specifically, knowing that they have been covered under federal and state guidance right. um, for many moons in a way that um, is different than, you know, what some other provider communities have, um, you know, essentially been contending with, if that's a fair term, from an enforcement perspective for some time. Okay. So I, I did take a look at, um, there is a skilled nursing facilities and nursing home requirement that was adopted, I think it was 2016, implementation 2019, um, saying that uh, they need to implement a compliance program as a condition of participation in yeah. the Medicare and Medicaid program. That's 42 CFR section 483.5. I believe. Um, well, well, for the purposes of the uh, five minutes or so left we have in the webinar, we'll go with that. Okay, all right. So, so I did take another look at that again. Um, um, most state compliance program requirements um, are more specific than what is in that. Um, there's a few exceptions and I'll talk quickly about those. So section C4 includes due care not to delegate substantial discretionary authority to individuals who operating organization knew or should have known through the exercise of due diligence had a propensity to engage in criminal, civil, administrative violations under the Social Security Act. Um, this does not conflict with state requirements, but I can't imagine, I mean, really, I can't imagine anybody would want to hire someone as a compliance officer that has that um, inclination. Right. Section D2 specifies that the compliance officer for organizations with five or more facilities must not be subordinate to the general counsel, chief financial officer, or chief operating officer. So that's generally a recommendation on our part. This is specific. In this case, um, it says that they should report to the governing body, um, which is, is a little bit more specific than the state. So I think if we're assessing a provider that meets this requirement, um, OMIG will consider the compliance officer reporting directly to the required provider's governing body as meeting that state requirement for 521-1.4B2. Great. So what I'm hearing uh, grossly, if I can characterize it, is that A, you're aware that these federal standards do exist and mm -hmm. wherever um, you see efforts to be compliant with those, you're going to take those into account favorably and try to solve conflicts as effectively as possible to the extent they exist. Yes, um, yes. So thank you for that. Um, I think, um, you know, we've found our way to the top of the next hour. And so with uh, that noted, I wanted to give Jackson an opportunity to provide some final remarks. And uh, we are very, very grateful, Kathy, to your office and to you personally for taking this time in a continuation of this series with your office. And we look forward to more opportunities uh, to educate our clients and friends. Jackson, let me turn it over to you. Thank you, Gabe. And once again, thank you very, very much, um, Kathleen, for your wonderful presentation. Um, you were thrown a lot of questions there at the end and really appreciate the thoroughness of your responses. Uh -huh. um, and as Gabe noted, we've reached almost two o'clock here. So this will conclude our programming for today. Um, as we noted, um, the presentation and the slide deck will be circulated to those who have registered, and the webinar will also be posted on the Bon Chenick and King website. And we want to thank you all very much for attending. We hope to see you at the next series.
Okay. Thank you.